So why do we keep falling into the dualistic split? And the answer to the third point is the trickster. He's the one that's holding the puppet strings. Because if you look at a lot of these dualities, they're actually bogus. Hello, and welcome to the Hilaritas Podcast, brought to you by Hilaritas Press. I am your host, Mike Gathers. Join me as we explore the world of iconic writer Robert Anton Wilson his reality labyrinth of ideas, and the many, many currents of influence running through them. Visit us at alertaspress.com slash podcast for show notes, links, and past episodes. And you can help spread the word and find the others by subscribing, commenting, rating, reviewing. It helps more than you might think. In our last episode, I spoke with raw file Eric Wagner on Ludwig von. In this episode, I discuss magical thinking with author, YouTuber, and magician Lionel Snell, better known in the chaos magic community by the pen name Ramsey Dukes. Lionel Snell, welcome to the Laratos podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Yeah. Same here. So I was... uh, Going to ask you to introduce yourself. I think there's maybe a mix of familiarity within our listeners. And um, you've mentioned you had a, a bit of a synchronicity while reading the Illuminatus trilogy. And, and so maybe if you want to go through your uh, brief history of magic, perhaps your experience with magic and, and how you uh, just tell us a little about yourself. How about that? Well, I guess I've always been interested in magic as a kid, you know, every kid is. And, uh, but I was brought up in the 50s, which was a very skeptical time. Mm. And um, I had a sort of traditional education where I was told, well, there's no such thing. It's a load of nonsense. But my curiosity continued. At the time, there was very little in the way of um, occult books and magic, very hard to find them. One, one specialist supplier in, in London. Um, but there was a, a sort of astrology magazine that had a few sort of weird articles in it that I used to get called Prediction. And in that, they reviewed the book of the sacred magic of Abramelin the Mage, which has been re- just been republished by Watkins. And, you know, it said, this is the real thing. And I was fascinated. So I ordered it from the Gloucestershire public library and kept it for a very long time. And I was absolutely convinced, why so I'm going to do this when I grow up. Uh, but of course, growing up is a bit more complicated than that. So it was many years later that I did it. But the other thing was that the science library in my school had a, a glass cabinet with an absolutely fantastic collection of books on alchemy and magic. Mm. And it was because a previous um, head of science who wrote the history of alchemy for Penguin, it was his collection, which he donated. So... There was I um, being told that, you know, this is all just fantasy and muddle-headedness, things like that. But I read things like works of Agrippa and Paracelsus, and I thought, no, this is, these people were observing very clearly. They were, you know, they, they were measuring things, taking notes. And so I, my respect for magic grew. But it was, at the time, I was reading sort of um, Dion Fortune, W.E. Butler, people like that. That was my only contact. I was warned off Crowley. But when Mm -hmm. I got to Cambridge and there was a big collection of Crowley books there, that really um, turned me on. Magic and Theory and Practice, I got hold of a copy of it in a a market. So that was uh, laid the foundation for my serious interest in magic. I got to know um, Gerald York, who was the guy who'd sort of kept the Crowley collection, and he later gave it to the Warburg Institute. And I used to go and visit him because he lived not very far from me. And he lent me um, Austin Spare's Book of Pleasure. Mm. And that was another revelation for me. Very obscure writer, but something he was saying, something so interesting. So, really, those are the two major influences on me, which led to my becoming known by the people who were going to be chaos magicians. 
And so there was, there was something about this scientific approach that they were taking that you noticed early on, taking notes, doing measurements that really caught your attention early in the process. And there were some, some sort of pretty weird things like um, Thomas Vaughan um, <laughs> with his sort of meetings on the moon and things like that. But basically, the, you know, it was proto-science. Um, they weren't deluding themselves. They, they actually noticed things in some ways better than a scientist because science nowadays is determined very much from what you mustn't see. You know, don't look at that. No, no. Um, we'll never get seriously published if you, if you start looking at the phase of the moon while we're doing things like that. Whereas they observed everything, which is very like Crowley's instructions you know, when you're meditating. Um, observe everything that might be relevant, you know, the weather, your mood, and things like that. Now, no scientific thing would ever say anything about their mood or the fact they desperately want to get a good result because of, they won't be paid. Um, so in that way, uh, I, I was struck by the honesty and the clarity of a lot of that magical writing. Wow. But um, a particular interest, I think, for this interview was um, my experience of Robert Anton Wilson. When Illuminatus came out, uh, and in England, I think it was about sort of 75 or something like that. Um, I absolutely loved it. I read all three. And I just felt so at home with it. Mm. And the strange thing is that um, I had, in 1970, I'd written my own book, a fiction story, also in three volumes. And um, I felt so much similarity with our thinking and ideas of what we were trying to do. Um, the difference is that he set it in America and I set mine in the world I knew, which was you know, the, last, the last year at school and then um, becoming, leaving school and things like that, a group of people. But it went through a similar sort of um, evolution because the first volume, which was the Old Testament, was their last year at school. Then there was coming away and, and going out into the world. And on the third volume, it really became a question of sort of um, rebellious movements across the country and um, doing crazy sort of, sort of terrorist, art terrorist activities and things like that. So I was absolutely fascinated. Now, I didn't continue... The only other contact I had was when he came to London mm. and I went to a talk of his. That was towards the end of the, of the 70s. And I was thinking today, why didn't I, because uh, I've been reading up on him today, you know, the, the Wikipedia and everything. Why didn't I um, sort of uh, latch on to him? And I realized it's something a bit paradoxical that when I find someone ideas very close to mine, in a way, I don't want to read them. I'm afraid that they have said everything that I'm going to be saying. And um, uh, that's one of the things. You know, it's, it's lovely to find someone has a similar idea to you. And I don't see it in terms of being my idea. I feel that um, there was a current, as we would say mm. in those days, and we both happened to tune in to that current and both expressed it in our own way. And my book... Um, was turned down by publishers and was never published and um, because yeah, it wasn't set in such a sort of fashionable media of the time as 1970. But I was interested because in the 80s, when I was, became known on the continent as a chaos magician, people tended to compare me with him. And the German magicians in particular said, oh, Ramsey Jukes is Robert Anton Wilson with a European voice. You know, they saw a very strong parallel there. And um, I, I think I was sort of frightened of reading it and finally said everything I was going to say and there's nothing more to be said. I, I guess I like to sort of um, come up with my own ideas, which is the opposite. The academic approach is if you find anyone who says the same thing as you, you must quote it and give the reference. You know, it adds, it adds to your the potency of what you're writing. But I tend to say, no, no, I, mu I, must, I must try to keep my mind clear and my mind rather than be overwhelmed by other people's ideas. So that's my relationship to him. And just today I started reading up and thinking, oh my God, yes, I see, I see what they meant. Yes, yes. So I've been uh, reading a little of your work and, and listening to your videos you're posting on YouTube and, and the parallels between your work and, and Robert Anton Wilson are, are quite striking. 
And I love this idea of like, there's this kind of uh, current of information, this idea that wants to make its way into the world and you tuned into it and Robert Anton Wilson tuned into it and, and both presented it in your own ways. And I can appreciate how uh, you kind of want to present your idea and, and you don't want to mix it with others. So you try to stick with what you know and not dig too much in the, to the other person. I'm personally trying to um, evolve one of Robert Anton Wilson's uh, big projects, so to speak, called the Eight Circuit Model of Consciousness. And so in that regard, I don't want to read what other people have written anymore. I'm trying to create my own version of it. So, uh, or just my own development of, uh, you know, further development of the model. And I want to, I want that to be unique to me and what I do. So I, I don't want to get too caught up in what others have written anymore. Just using the terminology of you know, reality tunnel, um, it sense you don't want to be trapped in someone else's reality tunnel. It's the sort of feeling that I uh, have. You know, I want to do my own digging. You know. Perfect, yes. I don't want their reality tunnel to influence my reality tunnel. And to a certain extent, you seem like you have both just kind of been un flown under the radar and underground, uh, so to speak. You know, you... You had a lovely story about uh, speaking at a chaos ma magic uh, event, and they said our next speaker needs no introduction. Yeah, yeah I almost fainted. Yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just been sort of stitching together these books, gluing them together, and and trundling around the country trying to find alternative bookshops that would take them. And so, when I was invited to Leeds and and um, to give a talk, Leeds University. And the person started like that. <laughs> yeah, I was astonished. And hey. at a, about the same time, um, someone came from Iceland and um, uh, introduced himself to me and said, I must buy some copies of Thunder Squeak because it's come, become an underground cult classic with the punks of Reykjavik. I thought, <laughs> wow, <laughs> I've arrived. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Excellent. And, and your writing is, is, as we said, is along that same current of Robert Anton Wilson. There was uh, something you said in your, uh, I think the video was entitled, Is Reality Real? Uh, but you discussed the gift of belief. And I think that's a, just a wonderful uh, phrase that kind of summarizes, you know, Robert Anton Wilson might talk about how we each have our own reality tunnel or belief systems and to kind of try on someone else's belief systems or maybe not someone else's but just another uh conceptual framework and see you know what is it about this different framework that fits for me or doesn't fit for me but in order to do that uh you have to you know give the gift of belief you have to kind of buy into this this framework so that you can try it on does that make sense to you is Yes, yes, indeed. That was, um, to me, is often the starting point for mm. a discussion with a rationalist or something, is that, um, you know, if you're uh, in the scientific context, and I'm speaking very broadly, say someone says, oh, I, I must lose weight, um, so I'm going to go on a low-fat diet. Mm. And another person says, haven't you seen the latest ideas that actually fat is not the thing that makes you put on weight, it's carbohydrate. Now, for that choice, it's actually quite important to know which one is right. You know, um, uh, it needs a bit more than faith. You know, so you go to your doctor to find out what you recommend. But um, uh, a magician might use the E King and astrology in the same day. He might you know, use one to sort of check up on the other. Now, astrology is based on a duodecimal view of the universe. Yi King, it says it's a binary universe. Now, mm. that ought to be totally incompatible, but um, the, the magician can use both and not see any problem. He doesn't have to know, oh, which one is the truth, which is the one I should be using. And so that got me to the idea that when um, a magician believes in something and the same with artists, they're actually giving a gift of belief. Mm. And I illustrate this by saying, if I talk to a sort of 
average crowd of, as it were, men in the street and said, who believes in fairies? I wouldn't expect many hands to go up. But if I said, who believes in equal rights for women? Um, a lot of hands would go up. Now, actually, the proof of the existence of fairies is stronger than the proof of the existence that women have equal rights around the world. Mm. So what's happening there? And it's um, when you say, I, I believe in equal rights for women, you're sort of giving a gift to that idea. You're giving it energy, if you like. And I mm. compare that, you know, that if you go to the theater, um, uh, to see a play by Shakespeare, a good play, you step into a totally fake situation. You know, people pretending to be what they're not on a stage which is pretending to be what it's not. And if a, s a skeptic said, oh, this is rubbish, it should be stopped, you know, it's, it's anti-reason, um, he'd be considered an idiot. Because you actually go in and you give yourself to that play. And if you do that, it can repay you with a fantastic experience. And to me, that's very much what, say, a tarot reader does. He may have been told that you know, there was no tarot um, evidence of the tarot before medieval times. But the idea that it can somehow, despite that, it contains the wisdom of the ancients and everything and great archetypal symbols. You go along with that and you begin to get good results. And so um, that's my idea that, and, and religion also wants it proven. You know, do you believe in fairies? Well, they're not in the Bible, are they? And the Pope has never mentioned fairies. Sort of for, for religion and science, something has to earn belief by showing results or being accepted by authority. But for art and magic, belief is a gift you give to it and it can repay you for that gift. Yeah, so that was, you know, the, the distinction that I made. Yeah. yeah, the phrase I've heard before, like if you're going to watch a movie, is uh, the suspension of disbelief. But yet what, what we're doing, what you're doing with, with the gift of belief is, is almost taking it up another notch. And then I love this phrase you had, giving it energy. Um, that seems really important to me, particularly if you're trying to impact change, so to speak, by, by giving the gift of belief, you're giving it energy and thus propelling it forward, presumably. Uh, so maybe we will one day arrive at a true equal rights for women just by giving that the gift of belief and continuing. It's obviously more complicated and requires a bit more than that, but, but that's, as you said, a good start. Um, and, and so, um, the other, the other piece that you said along with this in a, in a previous video is just kind of what Peter Carroll, uh, re references like game playing. Um, and that, when I think about all this, it reminds me of, of Douglas Adams' writing and how he anthropomorphizes everything. You know, he, he talks about the waves crashing on the beach and he gives them kind of a, a consciousness and a playfulness. In, in describing that, um, but it just uh, creates this openness, this curiosity, this playfulness. It's it's a different way of interacting with the world that seems to be very much what you're promoting, if I understand you correctly. Yeah. Mm. Yes. By um, uh, I've tended to write about magical thinking because one of the things that I was aware of is there are books which sort of grimoires of magic, um, which say they start from the beginning. They don't always tell you how to get to that beginning. When we've been brought up to believe that the world is solid matter and the scientists know the truth and everything. Um, and um, I think that, so the very sort of starting point of magical thinking for me goes back to a baby. Mm. And they put forward the idea that um, the idea that the science and the solid universe and facts and, and ex repeatable experiments is very sophisticated. But actually, that's the first thing I see a baby doing. Baby will take a spoon and go bang, bang, bang on the table. It's actually learning experimental, repeatable experimental results, getting the same, re getting a constant result. You know, it falls off the edge of the table and goes to the floor. And it begins to form, and I know it's pre-verbal, 
but a sort of explanation. You know, everything falls to the floor. That's why it falls to the floor. It's very <laughs> crude sort of proto-science. But when it comes to the behavior of mother, uh, it isn't so regular and predictable. And this is like the first taste of complexity. Mm. Now, how do you explain the fact that mother doesn't always pick up the spoon in the same way and put it back in the way the spoon falls down so regularly? And I think the adventure that the baby does is to say, uh, not to say, of course, it's pre-verbal, but to feel what if um, mind could live outside my head? What if mother has a mind like mine? Mm. And it no longer it doesn't predict things in the way a scientific fact does, but it gives you give you an understanding of what she's doing, and a little bit of ability to predict. You know, um, you begin to sort of put your mind into her, and I see that as really the beginning of magical thinking as more advanced than strict scientific thinking, because you you're looking at the world and putting your mind into it. Um, what if the dog has a mind? Ah, I think I can understand his behavior better. Um, rather than putting the dog in a laboratory, and just testing it with you know, probes and things like that. Think of it as a thinking a sentient being and you can actually react more sensitively to it. And that idea extends to, well, the weather can look pretty moody at times. Mm. Maybe the weather's got a mind. Maybe those waves on the ocean have got minds. What do they feel like? It must be a great feeling breaking on the shore, you know, um, and so on. And uh, the, it tends to be dismissed as something very unsophisticated, but I always think of the example of the market trader. He's got all these screens of information pouring in, you know, solid data. And he'll say something like, the market's really nervous today. Now, that's an interesting statement because He's sensing something about the market, which has got no scientific backing. He can't make any exact predictions from it. And yet it informs the way he's going to trade that day and will help him not to make mistakes. So I think this magical thinking, which people dismiss, actually continues through life and is used much more than people think. Yes. Yeah, so uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah. So, well, just the uh, last video I did, I looked at the way marketers and people who try to bend public will by putting messages into social media. Um, that is such a complicated thing. You can't possibly predict exactly what message is going to have what effect. But I think you do it, and this is my own experience of marketing, you sort of think of the public as a mind and put yourself in its shoes I think, how would I react to that? And it's that sort of method which you use to um, work with these very complex systems. It's interesting uh, listening to you discuss this because I've, I've noticed there, there is even a, f a phase of human development that we're, we've been talking about that's literally called magical thinking, where the child has that viewpoint. And I remember uh, when my sons were little um, and we'd set the table in, in front of them on their high chair or whatever and put the plate down and the cup down. And they would ask me, you know, is this where it lives? Um, so just this kind of wonderful view of the world. But then as I studied developmental psychology, it was almost like that's, that's just something you have to grow out of. This magical thinking is very primitive and, and just a, that's an absurd way to look at the world. And, you know, it's just a developmental stage we must pass through uh, before we move on. So uh, the way you're framing it is even maybe a more uh, evolutionarily advanced perspective. Uh, I've heard you mention that on other discussions about how this is kind of a necessary for us in a way. Um, it seems to me that when you start uh, approaching this wor the world in this way, that it really creates an opening uh, to access your own intuition. Does that resonate with you? Yes, yes. Um, There's quite a simple example that I, I've sort of done recently. Now, um, I can't remember the word for it. There's a word for 
people seeing things, patterns which aren't really there. I know mm-hmm. Pete Carroll has written about it. So something like parallelia or something, you know, a word like that. And um, so people who are deriding magical thinking, they'll give the example of people who think they see Jesus on a piece of toast, you know, or they think that the, the clouds have got faces on them and things like that. Now, um, I've been trained not to do that, but I thought, oh, why don't I try it? Mm. I started looking at clouds with a view to trying to see faces. <laughs> and I, I got quite good at it. You know, I began to see more faces and everything. And, and then um, I found that I could see faces in trees amongst leaves and things like that. The world was being peopled by faces. Mm. Now, people say, we mustn't do that. You'll go mad. <laughs> no, it was lovely. It was a whole, like an artist, it was a whole new perspective on life, you know, little faces, little figures peering from everywhere. And I would say it enriched my experience of walking in nature, (laughs) Um, enriched my experience of clouds. So that is, um, yeah, that to me is where magic and art are quite close to each other. And it is, you are drawing out that intuition. Um, Whereas you're supposed to say, Oh, it looks vaguely like a cloud, but of course it doesn't. You know, now it's falling apart. That's what you're supposed to notice. Um, Whereas I was allowing my, allowing is the word really, allowing Mm. myself to see faces. And then I could see faces everywhere and I enjoyed it. (laughs) I wasn't lonely anymore, if you like. Oh, no, you weren't lonely anymore. That's sweet. (laughs) Um, I I had uh, maybe a similar experience. I was working in a coffee shop yesterday morning and the coffee shop is right next to a veterinarian. And um, I don't know where I got this, but it was like a joke or a meme about how people, dog owners sometimes look like their dogs. And it seems absolutely ridiculous in a way, but I just started playing that game of watching, you know, people walk out of the veterinarian with their dog and, and just kind of noticing the connection between their appearance and their dog's appearance. And, um, uh, you know, if you just kind of uh, allow for that, you can come up with some some remarkable similarities. And then I, at the same time, I could say, well, okay, I'm, maybe that's a stretch and it's just my own creativity. And it's just wonderfully fun. But, but you're also, you are actually expanding your perception mm. because you begin does that dog look like its owner? No, he hasn't got floppy ears hanging down here and he hasn't got a furry nose. But he still does look like it. What is it? And it can be quite subtle body language, gestures, things like that. You're opening up your perception to levels of similarity, which uh, would be denied by a, a skeptic. You know, um, oh, you know, you can't possibly say he looks like his dog. And um, I think that that's, yeah, again, it's a, it's a richer way of looking at the world. Um, you begin to notice things which, you again, you weren't allowed to see, you know, not allowed to notice whether the body language of a dog is like the body language of its own. <laughs> it's fun if you start doing it. Yeah, it's lovely. And, and what comes up for me when you say open up our perceptions, or I was opening up my perceptions with the dog owner game, is that that is... Uh, creating more possibility. And uh, certainly it's been my experience that we're all, uh, I would say, we're all our own worst enemy and that we limit ourselves, or I don't want to put it that extreme, but I think that, you know, there's something about belief that we all kind of grow up with that is limiting. And then if we can open ourselves up to more possibility, that allows us to, uh, to, to do more, to, to stretch beyond our beliefs and our limits. Yes, the, the, there's a, the, it's a, this question of playfulness again, isn't it? Mm. It's, a, it's a game to start comparing dogs to their owners. And it's playful and it's fun. And it actually you're finding a new skill of noticing more subtle similarities. And you could use that skill to, I don't know, if you had the job of casting people for a movie, you know, the skills you're learning would be useful for that. These skills have other uses. And um, yeah, it's, it's the importance of play in that sense. And one of the things in that um, video about is reality really real is I point out, you know, 
this is so lovely, this playfulness, this enriching world way of looking at the world. Why doesn't everyone do it? Why do some people think it's a stupid thing to do? And I point out, actually, there's, a, um, there's an economy of not thinking like that. And the example I gave is an example of, you know, when faced with some rather curious coincidences, you know, synchronicities one day, um, and the magician might think, oh, is the world trying to tell me something? And might go and study the I Ching or something, and you know, uh, to find out. And the religious person might think, you know, God is speaking to me. And the artistic person might see the beauty of that sort of thing and try to make something of it. But the skeptic will say, sheer coincidence, it's utterly meaningless. And that person will get on with their work. <laughs> they won't spend the afternoon researching things or thinking up um, art or anything like that. They'll get on with the work and they'll earn money. And so. Um, if I go right back to, um, you know, the mammal accepting that we live in a solid world that's repeatable, um, my cat uh, jumps into a tree when the dog barks, and it doesn't sort of feel the tree to see if it's real or try to ask permission to go like that. He just treats it as an object, you know, just as a scientist. And it's a survival thing. So I'm aware that... Um, the survival value in not looking beyond the surface of things. Um, you know, that's the person who will go and earn some money, um, not waste time on speculation or wondering about the universe. But we've reached such a state of sophistication, we don't need all that survival. We actually, mm -hmm. I think, play um, enriching life. Uh, re-enchanting life is, is what we need now. Not, not sort of, you know, uh, this sort of safety obsession we have now, you know, <laughs> you can't do anything. Um, playgrounds have to be made of rubber so children can't learn how to fall out of trees. All that sort of thing is actually there's quite a strong need now for people to experience more, not less. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of why, you know, the sort of rise of magical thinking to me because of what it offers. Yeah, that seems, you mentioned you grew up in the 50s and it's a very skeptical time. Um, and I think of maybe two types of skepticism. Um, the one we're talking about in this case is just where we dismiss anything that we can't make sense of in a way. Um, that uh, we don't have a relationship with the mystery, so to speak. And we have to, you know, so if we can't understand it, um, it's too uncomfortable for us. So we have to just dismiss that. We can't be in this place of maybe, so to speak, or or just, you know, giving that the gift of belief and rolling with it. So we kind of have this dismissiveness. And, and what I'm hearing you say is we're kind of coming from that place in the 50s, maybe where it hit, hit its peak, perhaps, but to today where we just really need more mystery in our lives and, and more, uh, yeah, I don't know, that just comes up for me. An example for me of how um, skeptical the 50s was is I remember when I was at Cambridge, a talk by a hypnotist. And um, one of his anecdotes was uh, just after the war, he went to a hospital full of wounded soldiers in order to give a hypnosis demonstration as, as entertainment, you know, as mm. he was a stage hypnotist. And um, uh, he did the sort of thing of, you know, making people, I don't know, bark like dogs or something, I don't know, sort of usual sort of stuff. But uh, there was one person who said, this is all nonsense, they're just pretending. He couldn't even believe in hypnotism, mm. which, I mean, People now, uh, I say believe in it, you know, they've seen it on television, they've seen Darren Brown doing things like that, you know, so they know it's there. But no, he insisted that these people were pretending to um, be hypnotized, it wasn't real. So what the man did is they gave him, they hypnotized him and gave him the post-hypnotic suggestion, something like, when I snap my fingers, this person will vanish. And when I clap my hands, they'll appear. And um, he made the person vanish and reappear. And the man had no reaction whatsoever. 
had so he hypnotized him that everyone in the ward would vanish. The beds would be empty when he snapped his fingers. And um, uh, the man didn't react. And he said to the man, where is everybody? He looked around. He said, oh, they've gone out. Mm. And then he made them, he clapped his hands and they all came back. The man didn't react. Well, they're back now, aren't they? Um, you know, and this was crippled people, you know, crippled soldiers. Um, so he said what he did is he hypnotized the person that, that part of them would vanish, like their heads or half their bodies or something. And the man had a sort of breakdown when mm. that happened. His mind could no longer sort of um, fill the gap. And in terms of, you know, we live in a virtual reality created by the brain, the brain had reached the limit of what it could dismiss or ignore. And um, I was interested in that for two reasons. One, one is obviously its implications for the virtual reality idea and, and, and whether we can really trust what we see under certain some circumstances, but also as, simply as an idea that someone could be so skeptical that he couldn't even accept a demonstration of hypnosis. That was in the 50, early 50s, I think. Wow. So it's just, yeah, so he was so convinced that hypnosis was not real that he was creating his own story about how these folks were, were getting up and leaving and then coming back. And it's almost... And I think the, per yeah, the person also did the thing of someone standing in front of a notice, you know, said, can you read it? And then a person walked in front. And the man said, oh, you know, trouble with my eyes, a bit fuzzy, like that. Again, you know, talked his way out of it. The brain <laughs> sort of gave him a reason to dismiss the whole thing. R rather brilliant of the, hip hypno or the hypnos hypnotist uh, in saying, okay, if, if he's going to allow for that, you know, he's going to create a story that says, well, they just got up and left, you know, and oh, they just got up and came back. Okay, what if, what if only half of them disappears? That, that one threw him for a loop there. Um, and it's, it's it, in his own way, in, in order for him to maintain his belief system, he had to uh, sort of give a gift of, of belief that this, this can't possibly be happening. So it must be something else. Um, yes. And the, the breakdown, you see, because that the more solid your view of the world is, the more sure you are, um, firstly, the less chance that you'll ever notice, see any aberrations. Mm. But if you're forced to see an aberration, it's shattering. Um, you know, it really locks, knocks the earth out from under your feet, you know. It's, um, and uh, yeah, so there's a brittleness about uh, a materialist view of the world which is, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very rigid, but then when it, it breaks, it, it breaks, right? And, and you mentioned this, this concept of living in a virtual reality. Uh, can, can you say more about that? That seems very uh, yes. fascinating. Well, I usually start from the thing of someone who said, you know, <clears throat> oh, I saw you um, being interviewed yesterday. Um, um, and uh, by Mike, and, and I say, no, you can't have done because you know, yesterday I was um, somewhere else. <laughs> I was out for the meal or something like that. And um, we're, we're thousands of miles apart. And I said, what you mean is actually you looked at pixels, color pixels moving behind a glass screen while the air in a form that looked like me, while the air was actually being vibrated by a loudspeaker. And that's what you experienced. Now, to that, someone's something, oh, they're very smart ass. Yeah, I said, but he says, yeah, but I really was there. It was a real computer. I definitely saw it. I could touch it. And that's when I sort of raised the thing of, you know, what if Darren Brown had, or a hypnotist had told you you were watching me on a screen, whereas in fact, actually, it was switched off. Um, now, this is the sort of thing a stage hypnotist can do, you know, um, hand someone a bar of chocolate and say, oh, your brother on the phone wants to talk to you. And the guy can sit there talking to a bar of chocolate, you know, um, really believing he's holding a phone. Now, what I said is that actually our experience of the world, the world we experience is modeled 
by the brain. Mm. Now, it used to be thought that what happens is the senses, information comes in through the senses, and then the brain puts it together to give you this representation. But more recently, they realized that if it, the messages had to come through your nerves to your brain, and then it had to assemble them, uh, it wouldn't be fast enough for survival. If a rock's flying towards your head, you react so quickly. Um, and they realized that, uh, and they did it, they can test with the you know, brain sensors, that actually the brain builds, the, builds your virtual reality ahead of time. Mm. It's what it expects. It's predictive coding, they call it. And the signals from the nerves are used to um, sort of adjust it. And mm. um, so, uh, yeah, so you see what you expect to see. And if you've been hypnotized to see something different, that mm. you'll fall for that. Now, you see, um, people who thump the table and say, but look, surely this is reality. What is actually coming into their head? It's electric signals from your nerves going up into the brain. At the same time, photons going into your eyes and causing another set of electric signals from your optic nerve. At the same time as you hear the thump, at the same time you have this sense of the space around you, um, all your brain is receiving is little electrical signals. Like a computer, what does it do with those electrical signals? It gives you an experience of reality. And I call it a sensory user interface. And that experience of reality, it produces all the time. And your senses um, adjust it if something unexpected happens. Um, and to me, that's part of the role of consciousness. Because, you know, we talk about being conscious during the day, but a lot of the time we're in a sort of in a dream, you know, um, only conscious of a few things, like driving a car. And if something surprising happens, like a cat jumps in front of the car, suddenly you're, you really are conscious, you know. And I said, well, what if an octopus jumped in front of the car? You would be very conscious. You would stop the car, <laughs> you would get out, you'd turn around, you might even take a stick and prod it, you know, um, probably more conscious than you've been for all the rest of the day because your brain is trying to get the information to get rid of this anomaly. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you'll see way down the road, you know, an aquarium. Oh, it must have escaped from there. That must be it. Um, you know, the brain will work very hard to get rid of that. And um, yeah, so uh, I, I, I had an example when I was in Cambridge and I saw a ghost. I really woke up sitting up in my bed and mm. there was a sort of a figure with a snarling with a dagger over the bed. And I just stared at it. I didn't blink. I didn't rush to turn on a light or anything. I just stared at it. And it stayed there. And then it slowly faded to the swirly patterns of a, of a curtain behind. Now, I went on just staring because, you see, if you have this optical illusion, you know, where the sort of thing, you look at a, a picture and it looks like two faces facing each other. And then you look again, it looks like a candlestick, you know, <laughs> with, against a black background. Um, mm. Or one of those ones where you look at it one way and it's a young girl, look at the other way, it's an old crone. Um, once you've seen the trick, you can go to and fro between them. Right. Now, I kept my eyes unmoving on that curtain and tried to see how that image came out of that pattern, and it couldn't. And what that told me was that this is a one-way thing. It's not a little optical illusion, you know, where you can go to and fro. That actually has been censored by my brain. It's been removed and deleted. It won't let me see that again. Mm. And so that was a very early example of what I now see is the, the, the brain does a very good job of making things solid for us, sent, presenting us with that sensory user interface. And um, it's, it's basic to, all, I think, almost the definition of a brain is a thing that does that. You know, 
a bee lands on a flower and it expects the flower to be a solid object which will produce honey, you know, repeatable experiments, things like that. This, this is a very, very primitive idea, uh, but absolutely necessary for our survival. Um, and so that is why we cling on to it so much and why it's a real challenge to actually think magically and go beyond that surface appearance. Mm. Right. I've, I've read a lot about the predictive nature of our brain. It's a lot of resources are in, put into just predicting, you know, what's going to happen next so that we can live in maybe a more comfortable uh, less uncertain world. And it, so that makes sense. That gives rise to what you're talking about. Of, of We're so busy predicting, we're sort of creating this, this virtual reality um, in order to... Uh, what comes up for me in part is just when you get down to the atomic level, you know, you're talking about uh, protons and electrons and neutrons within an atom, it's mostly empty space. But but yet this desk that I'm sitting in front of is solid and uh, I'm sitting in a chair and I'm not falling to the floor in empty space. And uh... I wrote an article oh, in the 80s which went into the book um, Blast Your Way to Megabucks, My Secret Sex Power Formula. And it was um, uh, a car drove past me one day slowly down a high street and suddenly it swerved up onto the pavement. And when I looked, the front wheel had sort of come away from its bearings and turned at right angles. Yeah, it's just a, the metal had broken. Right. And the man got out and he was stunned. He said, oh my God, I've just been driving at 70 miles an hour down the M4 motorway. I just turned off and this happened. What if I had been driving it, you know, if it had happened when I was on the motorway? I'd have been killed, you know, the car would have rolled over and... Um, and that was a time when people were still quite excited about, well, they were very excited about um, Yuri Geller and the ability of the mind to make metal bend. Mm. And so what I wrote in this, I said, you know, wouldn't it be fantastic if you could just sort of focus on metal and it would go soft and bend? But wouldn't life be hell? You know, when you're cy bicycle cycling along and there's a pothole or something and you stare at it and you go over it, you know, whereas you've actually got to look away because um, you, you're fascinated by it. Um, I said, you know, you're in an aeroplane and you're in a bit of turbulence and you look out at the wing made of metal. And if concentrating on it can make it go soft, you'd want not to concentrate on it, but you'll concentrate on it because... <laughs> You're depending on it for your life. Life would be terrifying. You know, mm -hmm. be in a lift. And what about the cable holding the lift? You know, what if that goes soft? So the sort of conclusion um, uh, I put in that article is why is there so little magic in the world nowadays? It's because we're all such good magicians. We're holding mm. this chaotic world together so solidly that we can depend on it. We can actually go up in airplanes made of metal without them going soft, you know, things like that. So that was a sort of an early taste of that for me, the realization that, you know, we yearn for magic, but uh, a magical world would be pretty alarming, pretty terrifying. Mm. So it's almost as if we're unconscious magicians, so to speak, all of us. And there's something about becoming more conscious of our magical abilities, so to speak, our ability to see the world in a more playful and creative way. And the word allowing comes up for me. You again, see, the, again. The, yeah. the brain doesn't allow me to see ghosts, but, or see faces in clouds. But if I allow that, it begins to happen in an interesting way. Um, yeah, I suppose it's again analogous for the child. You know, here's a cardboard box where the fridge was brought uh, was delivered in. It becomes a castle. Um, yeah, he gets in it and he's king of the castle and he has a huge adventure with his cardboard box. Um, he's brought it to life. It's become a game. Um, 
And yet, for skeptic, it's just a cardboard box. What's the what's the, what's the excitement? Yeah. The, there's something wonderful about this word "allowing." Like uh, we already have this ability within us. It's not something we necessarily have to develop, but that we just have to tap into to allow. Mm. Mm. Um, it seems rather nice. What do you think about free will? Throw a curveball at you, maybe, but I'm curious about how. What do you think about that? Well, uh, I like it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think of it a bit like um, I was impressed when I read Jung's Memory, Dreams, and Reflections, where as he's getting old, he had a dream that he got up in the night. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't know if I get exactly right, but he got up in the night and walked round to a neighbor's house, and went to the bookshelf and there was a particular book with a title sort of on the lines of the dead do return or that there's an afterlife or something. And he woke up and I think he said he went round to that house and found that book on the shelf. Now, for many people I know, that would be utter proof of the existence of an afterlife, you know, the coincidence of going to the, there's a book with that title, you go next door. But what I really admired was Jung didn't say, I have proven that there's an afterlife. He said, I have proven that as I get old, my mind needs to believe in an afterlife. Mm. And I think that my mind needs to believe in, um, in free will or a measure of free will. When I addressed this in my book, Words Made Flesh, where I suggested actually the whole universe might be a virtual reality, one of the things I addressed in one chapter was, well, what about the notion of free will? Um, if it's a virtual reality, surely it's running a program, you know, and there is no free will, everything's preordained. But I said, and this is a sort of compromise, um, there might be very little freedom but it could be all important. And I said, um, I'm hungry, so I want to eat. Now, there are many, many levels. I'm hungry, I want to eat. That would be the mechanical thing to do, to have a bar of chocolate in my mouth. Um, but I know that a supper's coming up in half an hour. So I won't eat um, because I want to be hungry for supper. Um, I know that uh, I've been put on a diet, so I shouldn't be eating snacking between meals. That's another reason. Um, I might believe in some religious doctrine about, you know, um, one should put off gratification, things like that. There are many, many levels which one could address that, that same problem. Are you hungry? I want to eat. And maybe at any level, there is no choice. You know, it is automatic. The brain will just make us do the right thing. But there's still the question of what level do you approach that? You know, go up to the mystical level and, and you know, uh, will I grow through not eating? <laughs> the exercise of will, you know, like that. Um, so I know this is, uh, a philosopher would say this is really fudging the question. But I do feel that um, when people talk about free will, uh, they can be very absolute about it. You know, either you can do what the hell you like or you are totally automatic. And I think there may be things in between where um, there is one dimension of freedom in what is otherwise possibly a restricted world in, in other dimensions. You know, to say, that's it's a bit of a cop-out, but um, that's what I'm living with for now. <laughs> no, I, I can... Yeah, I can certainly appreciate that. Like there's a maybe just a, a spectrum of of free will that we fall into or I don't I don't even know how to put it, but I, I get what you're what what occurs to me and and this is just me thinking aloud is um you know, we get trapped in our beliefs, we get trapped in the, the structure of language and we just don't even realize it. Uh, until maybe we, we step out of it, maybe through a psychedelic experience or a magical ritual or thing that gives us a, you know, a different perspective. Um, but in that way, it seems like our beliefs um, and 
it's another topic altogether, like the structure of language and how we're imprisoned perhaps in the structure of language. But in a way, it seems to me like this is the trickster. It unconsciously limits us and we don't, we're just not even aware of it. I know you have some ideas on the trickster. I don't know if this resonates with you at all. I'm just curious how, how maybe you see it a different way. Yeah. I wrote a book called The Good, The Bad, The Funny. And what I addressed in that was that um, why don't we, you know, everyone agrees it's a polarity thinking. Thinking in twos is a problem. You know, it's us mm. versus them, God versus the devil, Trump versus the, um, what do they call the woke people, and so on and so forth. And it's just set up as a battle. And um, that's thinking in twos. Now, the book begins with a conversation, um, which is a sexist discussion amongst a group of men. This happened in Winchester, where the man said, you know, men either like women with large breasts or with very small breasts. That's because men are either looking for a mother figure or a daughter figure. Mm. And I said, well, that's funny because um, I could be with someone for quite a long time without no their breasts, but I know immediately if a woman has got legs or not. Mm. Now, I think it's, there's a division between men who are looking for an Amazon and those who are looking for a witch or a Melusine, a mysterious woman who melts below the waist, you see. And so I realized that here was a fourfold division, Amazon, witch, mother, daughter. Mm. A four, th four archetypes. Now, I talk about this in this book, and then I say, I wonder if you're getting angry at this stereotyping of women. Well, actually, we're stereotyping men's views of women. That's where I began. Um, because underneath it, there's a duality of the sexes. And that puts the anger and the, um, you know, the lack of appreciation of the other's point of view into it, that duality underneath. And... I said, that's interesting, you see, because we've got an example of twofold thinking and fourfold thinking. Now, if the world was divided to just one of those things, say men are either looking for a mother or a daughter, that could cause a war. The mother men say, basically, you're a pedophile. That's what you are. You know, and the, and the, mm. um, um, the other people, the, the daughter women would say, you never grew up, did you? You know, fighting Mama's in the streets, boy. something like that. Yeah. But if you have a fourfold system, you don't get a war. Uh, mm. You have a north-south divide in England, but, and you have an east-west conflict, but you don't have a north-south-east-west conflict, do you? Um, so fourfold thinking doesn't go to war. Mm. Does that mean it's really good? Well, no, actually, because fourfold thinking leads to stereotypes. In astrology, you're an earth, fire, air, or water sign. And people tend to stereotype. Oh, he's obviously an earth sign, blah, blah, blah. You know, he's obviously a fire sign, things like that. And so both of them crystallize out. One into a battle, the other into a sort of crystallizes into rigid stereotypes. And I said, what about threefold thinking? Going back to the thing, the, there's a strong tradition that the goddess has got three aspects. Um, there's the maiden, the mother, and the crone. And so you could say, oh, you're maiden. Oh, yeah, that's obviously the daughter, and the mother's obviously the mother. Uh, now, the crone, um, is she the Amazon or the, uh, or the, or the witch? Uh, uh, well, it must be the witch, surely. But then what's happened to the Amazon? Oh, well, the Amazon's just a projection of male mind into, into a woman. Um, no. You can't line them up. And what I realized is that the threefold thing is actually a circling flow. Mm. Um, because it's the moon at birth, the moon at full, the moon waning, and then there's the rebirth. And the same with ah, ooh, um, which is, you know, the, uh, the, the mantra, which is the initiating, the continuing, and then the changing. And similarly, in, in astrology, the cardinal fixed mutable. These threefold classifications are all have a flow to them. Mm. And so the question I asked in this book was, if in our religion, if instead of having God and devil, we had what 
I think it's the Aruba. There's a tribe in um, in Africa. They have God, Devil, Trickster, mm. three gods. Um, and so I'm saying if we moved from twofold thinking to a third position, how could it affect our view of the world? And I said, one thing you must get rid of straight away is if you talk about duality and polarity, people say, oh, yes, I agree about a, a middle position, a sensible middle position. I said, no, it's not that. Because that middle position just emphasizes that, that one line between the two. It's got to be a third thing which lies outside that line. And I mm. think of an equilateral triangle. These are three equal deities. So why do we keep falling into the dualistic split? And the answer to the third point is the trickster. He's the one that's holding the puppet strings. Mm. He's the one who's playing this trick on us. Because if you look at a lot of these dualities, they're actually bogus. If you take right wing versus left wing, you know, that's practically split America in half. But if you took a particular right wing person, and really found out his, his views. He's probably pro-Republican, um, pro-free markets, this, that, and the other. But he might actually send his children to a Steiner school because he believes it helps to encourage the artistic mind in young people to get their imagination going. Um, and similarly, you might get a person who is very left-wing um, and you know free and easy, free school. But he says, no, actually, I'm sending my children to Catholic school, because I think at a very early age, it's good to have a structure like that. Of course, they'll grow out of it. And so if you actually look at the details of people all along, it's a complete spectrum, a complete mix up of sort of rightist views and leftist views, things like that. And yet people will just split them in two and say, oh, you're a fascist or you're a, a wonk or whatever. You know, Communist. Um, yeah. So that whole idea that there's two sorts of people in the world, <laughs> um, right wing and left wing, is a, a complete fabrication. And yet, many people live their lives as though that was the most important distinction. Um, so that was what I explored, the idea that there's a trickster. <clears throat> and so in a lot of these dualities, if you could find that third position, um, it begins to loosen up that duality and you get a flow. And I had so many examples in the book. I'll just think of one for the moment. Um, the idea of rich people, poor people. Rich people, poor people. Completely splits the world. The rich got everything. The poor people got nothing and all that. Now, think of the trickster as Mercury, a mercurial figure playing games. The third principle I suggest is education. Mm. Because... It's, um, some people say, oh, yeah, but you have to be rich to have education. No, I got my education free. I got scholarships, and the government paid my education. So it's not as simple as that. I, I taught at Eton, and there were some very poor kids there who had a relative who paid for them to go there. So it is definitely a third factor. And it's the thing which sort of loosens it all up, because this is very important in Africa. Very poor people sometimes give up a lot to get their children to school because they know that's what will get them out. That's the thing that stirs up the pot um, and stops it just being a, a rigid division into two types of people. Uh, someone gets an education and they begin to move around. Flow. And, yeah, I sort of expanded on that. Yes, it's the flow again, things like that. And I looked at a lot of examples. I said, you know, going back to that first one, man, woman, that's, that's a Absolute split, man, woman, divides people. Add child. Mm. Child. And it now it begins to flow because at times the man will behave like a child. You know, he'll be playing on the floor and all that. And the, and the woman's trying to do something busy around the house. And the other time it's the other way around, things like that. Um, and people say, ah, oh, yes, but it's man, woman, creates child. So it's, it's not a, a, a level thing. I say, you could just as well say the child becomes the man and the woman. Though it really is a third position, the child, and it could transform. You get some very 
tough marriages until a baby is born. And you can either blow it up or else that can be the factor which is needed to bring the people together and to start living together. family. So it's, it's a very powerful thing, that third position, the child. Um, and you can't just demote it and say, oh, it's the lesser one of the three. Yeah, it's a, a lovely thought that if you move beyond this either or male, female, whatever it is, and, and add this third component, it creates that flow that things are moving more dynamic um i love that that's wonderful this this would have been a little topical earlier but you you have some ideas on the concept of manifestation and uh, i don't know what my question is but i'd love for you to talk about that a little bit if, if that works for you here yes it was um i think it was at the point when i was drawing a comparison between uh the world's on a laptop and what the laptop, the sensory user interface mm. it gives us, right. where we've got solid objects, things like that. And, and if you compare a conjurer, puts three cups in a row and he puts a ball under one of them, where well, he gives it to you to hold. Yes, yes, it's definitely a cup, it's definitely a ball. Puts a ball under one of them and um, it appears under another one. Now, the surprise in that is it's magic because, you know, once a ball is under a cup, it can't vanish. It's a solid object and it can't just materialize somewhere else. And so this, um, the brain again does its thing. I must explain this. Of course, it's a trick. Once he realized, you know, it's a trick, he's a conjurer, then no more mystery. There's fun, there's enjoyment, but not, uh, not awe and bafflement and wonderment, you know. It's, um, and um, I said, what is the, the computer has actually evolved rather like our brains have? Because if you give a computer now, a typical computer is the sort of laptop you'd give to a 15 year old to help with school. It's got a desktop. And um, you, if you say, what is this about? Well, it says, well, this is my, the essay I wrote for homework. And I say, it doesn't look like an essay. So they click it and it opens up there. See, it's an essay I've written. Ah, yes. What about this thing down here, which says it's, that says it's homework. Ah, no, that's a folder. And I can take the essay, I can slide it across into the folder, but it's vanished. Mm. No, I open the folder, it's there. But is it the same essay? Yes, opens it up. Look, it's the same one. It's, so it's real. Yes, it's a solid essay <laughs> just say solid object but it's, it's a real essay yeah and i can move it into different places things like that um and i also have the example of you know oh look there's three things there um what's the connection between them oh there's no connection that's my homework schedule that's a piece of homework i've written that's something that dad downloaded from the internet no connection uh, uh but it's real isn't it yes it's all real but then a programmer goes past and laughs at that because he says, no, no, that's not real. And he puts the thing into um, console mode. And there's this stream of words and data flowing down, flowing down, flowing down. And he says, that's the reality. It's mm. actually all language. But you've been given this sensory user interface. And those things, those three things you said that they're all totally different, they're actually all word documents. They've got a hell of a lot in common. They're connected. It's just you don't realize that. Um, and so we look at all this coding and wording flowing down. We say, so that's the reality, is it? He says, that's real. But then a machine coder comes past and said, that's not real. And he shows you the machine code, which is all zeros and ones, an absolute flood of zeros and ones. He says, that's what's really happening. That um, everything is zeros and ones, but we arranged it into words so that humans could sort of work with it and program it like that. And they made these interface, which you, you live with. So these noughts and ones, that's what's real. But then a hardware designer says, that's not real. Nought and one are just symbolic representations of two states of silicon matter, you know, charged or not charged. That's the reality behind it all. And I compared that with the Kabbalistic tree of life, the four worlds of the Kabbalah. Um, but uh, Malkuth, the world we live in, is like a fall down into matter. 
And above that, there's the world of, um, I can't remember the proper terms, archetypes, you know, words, meanings, meaningfulness, and all that. That's behind that screen of the sensory universe that the brain gives us. And behind that, there's a world which is so basic and simple. It's just yin and yang and the Tao, naught and one. Everything is the love of the one for the other, things like that. And above that, the religious people say, actually, the whole thing's an illusion. There's a different reality outside space and time that generates it all. So you've got these sort of, it's, it's like the computer, you've got these four levels of reality. And then I referred to the idea of how the unmanifest manifests. Mm. And the Kabbalistic thing says there are sort of three layers or three veils of the unmanifest. And in words, it can work like this. It's, Ain, ain't sof, and ain't so far. It is nothing. Having recognized nothing, it's like nothing is. But if nothing is, it implies that nothing need not be, nothing is not. If nothing is not, then something is. Ping! You've got manifestation. Mm. And it, it's, it's even nicer mathematically because... Um, nothing is zero. Think of zero. Now, how big is this zero? Is it a one-dimensional zero? Naught to the power of one, that's zero. Three-dimensional zero, a zero empty space, naught to the power of three is zero. Mm. A multi-dimensional zero. But if you get x to the power of x and you get x tending towards zero, you end up with naught to the power of naught is one. It's as though if nothingness if it's not allowed to extend in any direction, it's given no extension at all, it collapses in on itself and becomes one. So mm. um, it, it, it's rather nice, um, sort of gives a feeling somehow of something coming out of nothing. Right. And of course, once you've got one, you've now got Norton one, you've got yin and yang, and what's it, you know, the 10,000 creatures or whatever it is, you know, everything can come from that. But according to the Kabbalah, it comes through language and meaning. Another world is created of language and meaning. And out of that world of language and meaning, there's a fall to Malkuth, the material world that we live in. And so the sort of magical quest or the mystical quest or even the artistic one is sort of going up through that software to the levels behind it. It was an analogy that I, that I drew. And um, yeah, <laughs> It was rather nice because it sort of brought together the ancient tradition with um, modern thinking and an analogy of uh, these different layers of consciousness. And, um, and what's the problem? There you are on the desktop. How do you begin to find out about the language behind the desktop? And I suggest it's, it's things like those three things which we thought were totally different, we would discover they're all Word documents. You begin to notice coincidences. And this is the thing which, um, when people become interested in magic, it's the thing they most often remark on. I don't know if you saw that thing, what was that television program, a name of a place about a group of people who um, explored, they went sort of psychic questing you know, following up things and they went to places and they, they, they sort of meditated and doused and things like that and did divination. They found things. Um, so many coincidences cropped up. It got weirder and weirder as it went on. It was a real exercise in weirdness. Now, um, when you find these three things which some, something connects them, you don't know what it is, you begin to learn about um, they behave in the same way. There must be some software linking them, you know. And I think it's through sort of playing with that, you know. What um, if I see three cars go past and they all have rather similar number plates and I wonder whether they're trying to tell me something. Um, it sets me on a path of exploration, and I might look up those numbers in the tarot or numerology or something like that. I might find nothing, but 
I'm beginning to look at the, what is the meanings and the patterns behind everyday life. I'm beginning to explore. Like seeing faces in clouds, you know, as it gets easier and easier, you begin to think, well, maybe life is all around me. You know, that, um, maybe I may be seeing something which has a truth to it. Um, and it might have a meaning to it. Maybe I'm discovering my community of cloud people. I don't know. <laughs> it could take you anywhere. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, mm. There's a wonderful, well, it, what came up for me is just uh, like the Wizard of Oz and the man behind the curtain. But then it's like the man behind the man behind the curtain or, you know, just like hey, I've got my laptop here and I'm running Zoom so I can see you. And underneath that is running Windows. And as you mentioned, underneath that is the uh, the circuits that are making it all go and the, the chips and all that wonderful stuff. And um, it, yeah, just a lovely way to, to view the world as, as rich and complex and alive when you start digging into it. Mm. Um, well, I think you've touched on this and we've kind of gone, I appreciate your time. We've gone all over the, the place with this discussion. It's been lovely. What would you say, I mean, if we're promoting this idea of magical thinking, what would you say the advantages are to that? And again, I think we've touched on that, but just maybe in summary. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, we've sort of, so it's summarizing some of the things we've already addressed. Um, we, live in, we live in a world where we've got immense control. Mm -hmm. The world keep reminding us that we don't have as much control as we believe. But if you like, the reality tunnel is we're in says that science will find an answer to everything. You know, um, okay, right. COVID was a nasty shock. You know, okay, um, Russia attacking Ukraine was a nasty shock. But there is an answer there. Enough weapons or enough something. You know, um, and uh, you can't possibly let children play outside in the dark because it's dangerous and so on and so forth. Well, I think that through millions of years of evolution, through mammals to humans, to, you know, to apes to humans, um, we've got a tremendous capacity for surviving, being adaptive, being imaginative. Um, I mean, magical thinking, what's its value to the earliest humans? It's the belief that you could do the impossible. Yes. Now, for the individual, that could be a disaster. I'm sure a lot of people got killed believing they could do the impossible. But for a tribe, it gives you enormous dynamism. Mm. They'll always be thrusting out and doing new things. And so I think it's very fundamental to what made humanity such a successful creature. Um, and so... What we've got is a world, uh, let's call it a reality tunnel, which is so rigid and fixed. Um, and even when we get surprises, we think, well, it's going to be sorted out. You know, science has got the answer. And there's a huge part of us that wants, wants the adventure, wants the play, and um, yeah, wants other things, not to necessarily to get rid of um, that certainty, because as I said, with the example of the, if you could make metal bend, it'd be dead scary, but to find room to play. I've also put it in terms of like, you know, we've got a world covered over with concrete and every now and again, there's a crack in the concrete and a little flower comes up. And that is so exciting. Um, mm. So I'm trying to address people to finding those little cracks in their reality and looking for the flowers that pop up mm. and as pointers towards there's something else which is worth exploring and that is magical thinking for me yeah mm. when i think about the flowers coming up in the cracks and the concrete the words that come to my mind are like hope and inspiration mm. yeah um, yes for me at least that seems just like a lovely way uh, as you said this is fundamental to humanity and and the gift of belief gives gives that belief energy and uh so that allows us to to find the hope to find the inspiration to find the play to find the creativity the intuition maybe, mm. maybe you're feeling depressed but if you give the gift of belief that that flower came up in order to cheer me up <laughs> you, yes. you formed a relationship with it already 
Yeah. Oh, yes, that's lovely. Well, Lionel, this has been a uh, absolutely wonderful discussion. I, I deeply appreciate your time. I'm glad we were able to to reconnect. Is is there anything? I know you have a, a YouTube channel and you've been rather active lately, and we'll definitely put that in the show notes. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about? Is uh, I want to say you have a new book coming out, but I I forgot. <laughs> yeah. It's, you have quite. Uh, a, um, I, I will do another collected works. Um, uh, I've been invited to see if I can gather them together when I can get round to it. So gotcha. that'll be a th third volume of them. Now, I, it's been lovely for me because um, I especially appreciate the fact you sort of approached from a slightly different world, which is lovely. We've got a lot in common, you know, the um, Robert Anton Wilson world. It was like taking me back to something which I had... Uh, step back from almost fearful of finding you know it all i've been anticipated every film but it's like connecting again and mm. that was very interesting for me and the idea of reality tunnels and how it compares my ideas it's been very rich this conversation for me Excellent. and um i'll be thinking about it i hope i get some sleep tonight i'll probably be running it over in my oh. mind again and again <laughs> yeah okay so thank you so much Bye. appreciate that and uh I hope you get some sleep tonight as well. <laughs> that concludes our episode. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Lionel Snell for taking the time to connect with me from the opposite side of the planet. And thank you to Christina Pearson and Richard Ross of Hilaritas Press. Thank you to Ryan Reeves for putting it all together. Our next episode, releasing on the 23rd of October, will feature Andrew McLuhan. Until then, I am your host, Mike Gathers, signing off with love and cheerfulness. Amor e hilaritas.